Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the second session of the Scleroderma Rocky Mountain Foundation's Fall Education Summit. This, title is, this session is titled Grin and Barrett Strategies for Living with a Smaller Mouth. My name is Carolyn Buma, and I am a, a diffuse systemic scleroderma patient and co-leader of the Salt Lake City Scleroderma Support Group. Before we get started, I wanted to give you a few quick notes about this session. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function, and I will be monitoring the chat and will collect questions for the speakers. Be sure to check, check the chat for useless, useful information and links. This session is being recorded and will be shared after the broadcast. The Scleroderma Foundation in no way endorses any clinical trials, treatments, or studies mentioned in this session. Because the manifestations and severity of scleroderma vary among individuals, personalized medical management is essential. Therefore, it is strongly recommended that all drugs and treatments be discussed with your individual doctor. This webinar is for educational purposes only. So I would like to introduce the first of our distinguished presenters for this session, Sandy Bojic. Sandy Bojic received her doctorate in physical therapy from the University of Utah in 2014. She is a native of Riverside, Illinois, and grew up participating in a multitude of sports, and including a decorated college softball career at DePaul. Sandy utilizes Pilates, manual therapy, and other physical therapy tools to assess clients for deficiencies in movement that could be causing pain. By identifying these deficiencies, she can help clients eliminate pain and ultimately get to the root cause of their problem so they can get back to doing what they love. Sandy currently resides in, I'm gonna add beautiful Park City, Utah, where she takes advantage of the many recreational options. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sandy. I'll turn the time over to you. And thank you, Carolyn. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so um, I have a lot of information to share. I'm gonna kind of fly through this and I'm gonna focus more on the practical techniques um, of what you could do for just oral facial health, head and neck health. Um, and if anyone would needs more information, feel free to ask questions or contact me through um, email or I'm, I'm happy to share my phone number too. Um, so let's go ahead and get at it. Let's see here. Okay, so I came, I fell into this kind of kind of PT um, through my own experience. Um, so to make a long story short, I was just getting some sleep issues with breathing, jaw clenching. I have a tongue tie. I found a myofunctional physical therapist who specializes in this sort of physical therapy, which I, I would definitely recommend finding one if you're looking to explore this more for yourself. But you can see, um, so just the results I had, that's my tongue up top there. Um, when I first went and started with the myofunctional therapist on that left side, you could see how my tongue was tethered there. And the picture on the right was only a week later. And what I did was I just applied um, kind of soft tissue techniques strengthening, mobilizing of the tissues around my head and face, which is something everyone is able to do. Um, and the first thing um, that comes to mind when I'm looking at this area of the body is breathing. We take 17,000 to 24,000 breaths a day, roughly. Um, so that's priority. That's what keeps us alive. If we're inefficient in any way, uh, it's going to manifest, it can manifest itself as sleep apnea and, uh, or a multitude of other, other kind of dysfunctions. What I'm interested in is the way the biomechanics of breathing affect the head and neck. So I'm just going to play this little video here. Um, this is an MRI showing, um, the diaphragm descending. So in a second here, you're going to see Yes, the ribs go up and out and the diaphragm go down and the diaphragm comes up as you exhale. So just notice that huge motion that takes place within the torso. So if there's any deficiency in breathing, it can manifest all over the body. Um, 
So just a little kind of more specific um, view of the diaphragm here. It lives within the base of the rib cage and it sort of acts like a bellow, which this is like an old school way to keep your fireplace going. Um, so if you look at the bellow, the bottom of it, where the um, sort of fan is opens up and that would be uh, comparable to when we take an inhale. It has a really small thin nozzle up here to move air quickly as you open it. So essentially when we're breathing, we want a thin nozzle to help move air all the way down into the lungs and to help push air out. So the point um, or the analogy with that would be nasal breathing. So when we nasal breathe, we have a small nozzle that comes up through our nose down to our lungs. When we're mouth breathing, that nozzle opens up and we're not as efficient with moving air in and out of the lungs. Um, so on this slide, you'll see just some of the functions and benefits of nasal breathing. It's kind of all the rage here with some people. Um, and in terms of when you're exercising um, at night, I'll show you <laughs> kind of some things you could do at night to help promote more nasal breathing. Um, and form follows function. So when we're mouth breathing, you can see on the bottom, our face will kind of adjust to being in that position of uh, having an open mouth. So we'll have sunken eyes, uh, jaw will recede and go back. Maybe we uh, forward head posture, tightness around the neck. So ideally we're trying to optimize our nasal breathing so that this whole region of the body um, is, is in optimal posture. And some ways we can go about doing that are um, by promoting nasal breathing. So the first thing I'm gonna go over is just a sinus massage so that we can open up this area of the face. These are pictures of the sinus bones within your head. So right behind your nose, you can see they kind of look like wind turbines. And I'm in Utah, there's a lot of sandstone down south that has these sort of shapes. And the way they're formed is through wind. So it's kind of cool how we have that within our body too. And um, laying on top of your face, you have all sorts of muscles. So these are important for scleroderma too. Um, so when it comes to just treating some of the restrictions around the face, we can focus on these muscles. And I'll demonstrate what I would do to um, kind of release some of these muscles or to improve the pliability and the suppleness of them. So the first muscle is the frontalis, which lives on the top, just your up on your forehead. You can either use your fingertips to just get in there and give some light pressure and be sure your skin's kind of moving back and forth. So we want that ability to move the tissue on top of the bone there. Um, the procerus muscle, the next one lives in between the eyebrows here. So your sinuses come up and over the eyebrows here. So releasing all those muscles can theoretically help to improve the airflow through the sinuses. And I'm using my fingertips. The other thing you can use is the heel of the hand. That's kind of a nice way to massage the face here as well. Um, I'm gonna skip the next one and I'm gonna go right to the last one for time's sake. This is the obicularis oris. It doesn't live up around the sinuses, but I think it's important for um, for people with scleroderma. Um, and all I want you to do right now is just remember the obicularis oris lives around the mouth here. So it's kind of the sphincter muscle that goes around the mouth. Okay, all of these muscles can be massaged with those two techniques. All right, so nasal breathing drills. Um, one's just to hold water in your mouth as you do chores around the house or go for a walk. Um, try setting a timer three to five minutes, see if you can hold the water for that long without spilling it. Other ones, single nostril breathing, just blocking one nostril breathing through um, one side, then doing the other side. You can do mouth taping. You can try to mouth tape while you sleep at night to help keep the mouth shut and to improve the length of that obicularis oris muscle. Like I said, I'm gonna kind of fly through these. Um, I'm gonna skip that slide for now. Diaphragm drills, going back to that big muscle that moves air. Um, squishy ball on your stomach, lay on it. Big, deep breaths in and out. And these are some other uh, breath drills. And what these do is help to strengthen the diaphragm. So it's gonna push against resistance. And it'll also give you feedback so that you can feel your whole torso moving with your breath. 
and it also helps to mobilize all those tissues around the uh, torso. The next topic I'm going to cover is swallowing. So what's crazy is that there's 50 pairs of muscles that are involved in swallowing. I wasn't aware of that they don't really teach that in PT school. Um, and I'm going to play this video here and this shows some optimal swallowing. And what I want you to notice is how the food gets pushed up to the top of the roof of the mouth and then goes down through the esophagus. And then watch this hyoid bone move up and down. That's all a muscular activity. It's also reflexive too. Um, so kind of an interesting video just to see all the activity that goes into chewing and swallowing there. Okay. So with swallowing, the main muscle is the tongue. It's a very muscular organ. Um, and I like to think of it as a gateway to the nervous system. We have a lot of cranial nerves that attach or um, send signals to and from the tongue. There's muscles within the tongue. Those are the extrinsic, in, extri intrinsic muscles of the tongue. And then these muscles on the bottom are all the extrinsic muscles that kind of stabilize the jaw so that tongue could push up and back. So when it comes to posture, we kind of go back to that mouth breathing versus nasal breathing. When we mouth breathe, we tend to leave the tongue on the bottom of the mouth. And ideally we want that tongue to rest up on the top of the mouth. Um, teeth are separated gently or slightly touching, or uh, teeth are separated or gently touching with lips closed, okay? Um, that's, um, when I'm looking at posture too, I'm not just looking here. I'm also looking around the head, neck, and shoulders. So these are just some muscles around the shoulders and the neck that I think are important for the positioning of your, um, upper body and your head and neck there. The next thing I'm going to show you is a hyoid release. So our hyoid bone sits right here. It's a floating bone and we have muscles below and above. The easiest way to release some of these muscles around the hyoid is just to take your knuckles and you look up as you drag the knuckles down about halfway through the neck there. And gentle pressure, because this is not like you're digging into your quad here. These are little muscles. So again, just one more time, taking your knuckles all the way from the tip of your chin down to your hyoid. So we're trying to increase the length through this area here. Okay. And some tongue exercises you could try is taco tongue, hold it for 10 seconds. And some of these you might be surprised too with um, kind of the fatigue you experience within the tongue. Um, and then just sticking your tongue out, straight out, hold 10 seconds. You can go out to the right, out to the left, down and holding each one 10 seconds, repeating it three to five times. Pretty easy exercises um, that don't take up a lot of, not too much effort, not too much time. Um, other ones are you could slide the tip of your tongue along the inside of the jaw. And the goal here would be to keep the jaw still as you do that. And the other, and, and then sliding the tongue on the outside of, of the teeth around the jaw, okay? And all those sets and reps are arbitrary. What I'm looking for is that you're just creating a practice and you get results over time. The next thing we're going to go into is the temporomandibular joint. That's our TMJ, as people will call it. Um, some people are experiencing clicking, locking, um, and you have very big muscles that cross over the TMJ. They're very strong too. So you have your temporalis muscle that sits on the outside of the skull here, and then your masseter muscle that sits down here. Both of these muscles help to close the jaw, and that's where we can get some of our clenching from. Um, the way I, I release these at home, same thing like those facial muscles, you can either use your fingertips to get into that temporalis bone and sort of glide the skin on top of the skull. Um, and the masseter muscle responds really well to trigger point release. So what I would do is stick your finger in there. You can go pretty hard with that. It might be painful though, so start gentle and just hold it about 30 seconds. And then one more technique is taking your knuckles, going from your cheekbone, opening your jaw as you slide the your hands down the outside of your jaw. And repeating that about five to 10 times. Okay. Now, next one, we're gonna do an intraoral release. So I'm gonna demonstrate this. Um, I generally use gloves for this, but another way you could do this is in the shower when you're just nice and clean. Um, 
So cheek release, going back to that muscle that goes around the mouth here, which is important for that, um, just for those with scleroderma here. The first thing I'm gonna show is a cheek release. So we're, we're addressing this muscle and then the muscles that go all the way back through the cheek here. So what you would do is take your finger, take it to the inside of your cheek and just kind of stretch it out side to side. So I'll demonstrate that here. And what you'll notice are kind of maybe some thick bands through the cheek. And you can take some time to kind of work through those to create some more suppleness through those tissues. Um, so what you're paying attention to, like I have here different textures, is it restricted, is it painful? Do you feel better afterwards? Um, so just kind of notice that before and after to see if you're getting results. The next one is a lip release. Um, really easy, again, addressing that orbicularis oris muscle. You take your fingers and you're just gonna gently pull on the cheeks here or on the lips. Ooh, I got a, a nice pop out of that one. <laughs> and then you could go to the top lip, use your thumbs, and then just gently pull away from the teeth here. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip that medial pterygoid for now. We're gonna go to the tongue release next. Um, so what that'll look like is I'm gonna stick my tongue out and you're gonna slowly drag your fingers down the tongue. It'll look like this. Okay, and you'll be surprised, it's pretty painful. There's, I get trigger points in the tongue. So what you can do is also hold for about 30 seconds. And again, you're just going gentle. You can also do a contract relax technique. So the goal is to get more mobility of the tongue to stick out. So what that would look like is this. I'm gonna stick my tongue out, hold it there. And then I'm gonna pull the tongue away um, a little bit more after about every 10 seconds here. So I would stick it out, relax, pull, relax, pull, okay? All right, and that's about all I have here. So I think um, hopefully I stayed within the time frame there. I know that was pretty fast. If you have any questions, this is my email here. I'll also put it in the chat. Um, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to do that whole presentation again, like um, the whole one at a slower rate so we can go over those techniques more. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, just feel free to contact me. Dr. Leader is the director of the Tufts University School of Dental Medicine, DMD, MPH, dual degree program. He is a member of the Tufts University School of Dental Medicine class of 1985 and earned a master's of public health from the Tufts University of Medicine in 2013. Dr. Leader is a nationally recognized expert on scleroderma and oral health. I have, I have, uh, if others are like me, I, I've looked up many things that he does because he is the scleroderma specialist of, of uh, dental. Dr. You, Leader Karen. is a nationally recognized expert on scleroderma and oral health. First of all, Carolyn, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And uh, Dr. Vojcik, Dr. Vojcik, um, Excellent presentation. It's uh, kind of funny. On Monday morning, I'll be giving a lecture on emergency treatment of TMJ problems. And uh, a few of the things that you mentioned, I think I might co opt that myself. Uh, I am uh, a professor at the Tufts University School of Dental Medicine and at the School of Medicine. I'm also uh, a new member of the Medical and Scientific Board of the Scleroderma Foundation, but I've been working with the Scleroderma Foundation since 2005. Just wanna mention, I have no conflicts of interest with any of the uh, products that I might, or programs that I might mention in my talk. So I was asked to speak about scleroderma and periodontal disease. I just want to mention overall how scleroderma affects oral health. And this is a slide that I often use. Scleroderma is uh, closely associated with xerostomia. You may have heard, uh, which is dry mouth. You may have also heard of Sjogren syndrome or secondary Sjogren syndrome. Uh, these are issues that your dentist and your physician can work together to help you with. Scleroderma has effects on teeth and bone, such as osteolysis and resorption, and of course the dryness can cause more tooth decay and periodontal or gum issues. 
pain and difficulty opening and sclerodactyly, uh, which makes it hard for you to provide your own home care sometimes. There are oral effects of medications that you must take for scleroderma, psychological effects of having a chronic illness and how that might affect your ability to do your activities of daily living, like your oral health home care. And also the uh, constant unremitting gastroesophageal reflux that many people who have scleroderma suffer with. So effects of medications, the dentist and the physician need to work together on this. Uh, medications may cause dry mouth or xerostomia. Medications such as nifedipine, calcium channel blockers, can cause your gums to grow in, and become larger and more firm. And this is a part of taking that medication. It's important to recognize that and to have that taken care of. Uh, oral lesions, some medications can cause you to get sores in your mouth or have uh, the lining of your mouth be irritated, stomatitis. Uh, if your mouth is dry or if you're taking certain medications like steroids, you may be more likely to develop thrush or candidiasis, a fungal infection in your mouth. Many of these medications, over 60 medications cause taste changes and also that your mouth is dry makes it harder to taste many things. Osteonecrosis or bone death of the jaw can be caused by taking bisphosphonate medications that many people take and also by taking steroids. Many of these issues affect periodontal health. Now here are the signs of periodontal disease and this is a list from the American Academy of Periodontology. These are, this is the, um, the sort of college of gum specialists. So red, swollen, or tender gums, bleeding gums, receding gums, looser separating teeth, pus between your gums and teeth, sores in your mouth, persistent bad breath, a change in your bite, and a change in the fit of your partials. And interestingly, these signs and symptoms can be caused by scleroderma. So it's very important for the person treating you to understand the difference between problems that are being caused by scleroderma and problems that are being caused by periodontal disease. So here are the stages of periodontal disease. The basic difference between healthy gums and gingivitis compared to teeth that have periodontal disease is the bone loss. So if your gums are just irritated and swollen and bleeding, but the bone is normal, that's gingivitis. But if you start to lose bone, that's periodontal disease. So, it's, so keep that in mind. And of course, you all know this way that we use a tiny millimeter ruler to measure how deep the pockets are. If you have uh, periodontal disease or even gingivitis, this can be kind of uncomfortable, but it's important for us to use this to get an accurate picture of how healthy your gums are. This is a set of x-rays or x-ray images of someone who has healthy gums. And you can see that the bone comes uh, very high up on the roots in between the teeth. If you have periodontal disease, you can see that uh, a lot of the bone is lost. In fact, with this patient, they are missing about 50% of the bone around all of their teeth. And this is from periodontal disease. You can also lose bone from scleroderma, but it looks different. So in scleroderma, and this is nothing new. So um, let me just back up a second. Teeth are not held into the bone directly. Teeth are held into the bone by a thin ligament that fits over the root of the tooth like a sock, like a thin sock. In scleroderma, that ligament can become enlarged and dentists will see on dental x-rays that many of the teeth have this dark area around the root of the tooth. I hope you see me pointing at that. And we say 
the, there is widening of the periodontal ligament. If you have widening of the periodontal ligaments on many teeth, that is pathognomonic for scleroderma, which means if you have this, then you have scleroderma. And this is not new information. I learned this in a, uh, when I was in dental school in 1981 in my textbook, which had been printed in 1980. So this is definitely not new information. Something that is new is a group in Canada, and this is the second citation on the slide. Um, and they published this, I think about 2014. They found that if you have more of this widening of the periodontal ligament space, then you are likely to have a worse course of scleroderma. So once again, uh, physicians aren't going to see this, but it's a way that dentists can help physicians understand your disease. So let's talk about prevention for periodontal disease. First of all, it's important to treat the dry mouth, the xerostomia. It's important for you to be able to do your home care, and we'll talk about that. And it's important to have regular professional dental care. Most people who have chronic illness should be seeing the dentist every three months instead of every six months. Also with scleroderma, because of the chance of losing uh, tooth substance and losing bone from osteolysis or internal and external resorption, it's important to have annual panoramic x-rays. These are the x-rays like I just show showed you where the machine goes all the way around your head and shows the jaws and the teeth all at once. So what can we do to treat dry mouth? First of all, we can be aware that uh, more than two thirds of people who have, an, uh, who have scleroderma are likely to have dry mouth and some may not even notice it. So it's important for us dentists to get involved with diagnosing that and there are ways we can do that. We can look at what medications you're taking and see if any of the medications are causing your mouth to be dry. Sometimes it can be as simple as the antihistamine that you're taking or the decongestant that you're taking and switching to a different one might improve that. We can prescribe muscarinic agonists, including Evosac and Salagen to trick your salivary glands into working harder and making more saliva. So the salivary glands are, in, for most people who have dry mouth, still work partly and we can induce them to work more. If you're taking these medications, remember, it takes about six weeks of taking them every day, three times a day, before you notice an improvement. And then it takes about 12 weeks for them to reach their fully potentiated effect. If you double up on your dose, thinking that it's not working, when it does finally work, you may find that you have more side effects. And one of the big side effects is these medications can make you sweat a lot. I've never seen that. I've never seen patients who sweat a lot. Um, and that may be because when I've prescribed this, I've been very clear with patients about not doubling the dose. Let's see, there we go. Uh, microstomia and sclerodactyly. So of course the small mouth opening and Dr. Vojcik did a uh, an amazing job of showing you ways that you can improve your mouth opening. I like the techniques that she was showing you and, uh, and I'm going to incorporate that into my recommendations to patients in the future. Um, and sclerodactyly, of course, tightening of the fingers can make it hard to hold a toothbrush correctly or to use dental floss. So let's talk about that. There are adaptive toothbrushes available on the market. I do not recommend the Dext brush because even though it's easier to hold, it's designed for people who have rheumatoid arthritis, it has such a large head that if you have a small mouth, it may be very hard for you to use it. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink of water. The Benefit Plus toothbrush is a little bit better. It's basically three toothbrushes that are held together in this rubber sleeve. Because it's three toothbrush handles, it's easier to hold. 
one brush gets the cheek side of the teeth while the other one gets the tongue side and the third one gets the biting surface of the tooth. This is uh, not an expensive device and you can find it online to purchase. I personally recommend the rechargeable Oral-B and Sonicare toothbrushes. They are both very good products. Use the small heads. Uh, I especially like the small round head with the Oral-B toothbrush, but the Sonicare small head works very well also. If you decide to use one of these, they have a nice fat handle that's easy to hold. The vibrations of the toothbrush do most of the work for you. And it's important to speak with your dentist or dental hygienist to get a demonstration on how to use these correctly. When flossing is a problem, I highly recommend the Reach Access Flosser. So this is a device with a handle that's shaped like a toothbrush handle. It has white bows with a strand of floss stretched across that snap into the handle. And if the handle is too skinny for you to be able to hold well, you can always wrap it with duct tape. And uh, this is a very inexpensive, this is a very inexpensive uh, device to purchase and it's very easy to use. Oh, I'm sorry, I almost forgot the water pick flosser. So this is a good device also. It's a little harder to get around your back teeth. It uses little plastic picks to clean in between your teeth. And um, the, uh, it is not a water pick. It does not spray water. And that is not what I recommend, just the water pick flosser. So to help you find a dentist, there are many specialists who specialize in oral medicine and in public health, and they have extra training to work with people who have chronic illness. General practice residencies and advanced education in general dentistry um, residencies are uh, a very good way for dentists to get training to work with patients who have autoimmune disease. There is a website, scdaonline.org, specialcaredentist.org. And uh, these are dentists who feel that they are better able to treat people who have uh, autoimmune problems and chronic health problems. Dental schools often have oral medicine departments and tertiary care hospitals have dental clinics. So these are large regional hospitals. If you have a dentist who you'd like to work with, I welcome you to send an email to either me, david.leader at tufts.edu, or my colleague, Luis Del Castillo at hotmail.com. And we are happy, we are very happy to work with your dentist to make sure that they know how best to treat someone who has scleroderma. Uh, what we need to explain to a dentist so that they know how to take care of a patient who has scleroderma only takes about 20 or 30 minutes of that dentist's time. And we do that as, as volunteers for the dental, for the uh, Scleroderma Foundation. So in summary, tell the dentist you have scleroderma and how it affects you. Annual x-ray imaging, particularly with panoramic radiography is important for prevention. Bring your list of medications and your physicians, schedule for the best time of day for you, do your physical therapy, like Dr. Uh, Vojcik said right before, and bring gloves and a blanket because we're dressed heavily for, uh, for everyone's protection in protective gear and it's hot. But if you let the dental staff know that air conditioning is a problem, they can probably turn it down for you. And orthodontics and general, dental implants are often okay, but it's really important to see if scleroderma is causing areas of bone resorption uh, or um, osteolysis before you start either of those treatments. Medical team should diagnose and treat xerostomia. Uh, they should diagnose and treat gastric reflux aggressively. Watch for side effects of medication that may affect oral health. Prescribe physical and occupational therapy because dentists cannot do that. And they should refer their patients to dentists. 
and also provide medication lists and recommendations. In the Scleroderma Foundation, we have this uh, brochure that you can easily download from sclero uh, scleroderma.org. The most recent version has been reviewed by me and by some of my colleagues for accuracy. And let's see. Oh, also, I recommend that you sign up and participate in the SPIN cohort at www.spinsclero.com slash en slash cohort. It's a, uh, a group that sends out regular questionnaires to thousands of people who have scleroderma to learn more about, uh, about scleroderma and how to help you. Thank you. Carolyn? Thank you very much. That was, that was really interesting. Um, we have quite a few questions. We'll see how far we get. If it's okay with everybody, I might say that we go till 1220. Give us a few more minutes. Obviously, anybody can jump off whenever you need to. But if, if uh, Sandy and Dr. Leader are okay with that. Um, so there have been a lot of questions around your comment about water picks. Why are they bad? I'm not saying that the water pick is bad. And when you speak with a periodontist, they will say it is better than nothing. Okay. All right. But you would prefer flossing. The, the, the mechanical action of scraping this plaque off your teeth is much more... Uh, when you wash dishes, you don't just spray water at it. Uh, although you might in a dishwasher. But uh, if something is stuck on a dish... You're not just going to spray water on it to get it off. You're going to scrape it off, right? So okay. that's what floss and things like the water pick flosser do. Um, it, it, that's great. But it's it. I, I think most people, well, some people were concerned about whether it was doing negative no. things to you. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So, okay, perfect. All right. Um, somebody asked about implants for scleroderma. How effective? So... I have seen many scleroderma patients have good results with implants. It seems that as long as you're not placing the implant into an area of osteolysis, and it's important for the, uh, for the dentist who's placing the implant to understand what's going on there, that there's actually cells that can eat away at the bone. So um, it's conceivable that a dentist would see that a patient has lost bone around a tooth and they want to put in some artificial bone or some cadaver bone to build it back up again and put an implant in. And then those uh, cells that eat away at the bone are still there. So it's important to, for that to be evaluated. Okay, wow, that's good to know. Um, uh, what can be done other than pulling a tooth for widening the period for the widening of the periodontal ligament. There isn't anything to do for that. It's just something that you need to know that that's going to happen. Uh, most people who have scleroderma have an issue with the widening of, well, I'm, I don't know about most, a lot of people who have scleroderma have this issue with the widening of the periodontal ligament space and do just fine, just realizing that their teeth are a bit wobbly. And um, the the problem that can come up is a dentist, uh, you know, like say someone, I, I'm 61, a dentist my age could look at that and forget that 40 years ago, we learned that that's a normal thing for someone who has scleroderma. And we think that there's periodontal disease going on and we're trying to treat periodontal disease, but this isn't periodontal disease and our treatment isn't going to help. Uh, this person is experiencing, and I am too, constant post-nasal drip, Na makes nasal breathing challenging. Any suggestions? And they are on a steroid nasal spray. Um, I would say, you know, that steroid nasal spray is probably is, is good, that that's something you're trying to clear that. Um, there are techniques, and I can't tell you off the top of my head, there's a book called The Oxygen Advantage that has protocols for clearing 
um, a stuffed nose. Um, and that the author is Patrick Mc, McKeown. Mc, I, I don't know exactly how to pronounce this, M-C-K. So McKeown, I think. Um, so there's some protocols you can do for um, helping there, when we nasal breathe, nitric oxide is um, increased into all the blood vessels and the head and neck. And what that does is it helps the vasodilate and open up uh, arteries and vessels. So the more, the more, whatever you can do, I would say, try to do it. So if you can use some of those drills, like the single nasal breathing, um, like try to mouth tape, um, try to hold the water in your mouth, even if it's just for 30 seconds, I would say just try to do what you can do. Okay, that's very good. Um, this person's wondering about the use of hydrolyzer Laronic acid and platelet rich plasma in helping restore flexibility and fullness, as well as soften the mouth or gums. They've already lost seven teeth, uh, already had seven teeth grafted, and worry about more recession as well as the function and fullness of lips. Right. So, uh, Carolyn, I don't know if it was you or Rachel who sent me that question earlier. So, I did take some time to look that up. And um, I can't find any. Uh, recent papers on using uh, that type of treatment for periodontal disease. I, I did see using injections of hyaluronic acid for basically uh, improved cosmetics in the gums, uh, but only in the case of, uh, you know how as your gums recede, you get a dark space between the teeth? So it was to plump up that tissue in between the teeth to make it um, look not so empty there. Uh, so I, I really can't comment on this. Uh, it may just be too new. I looked into this a little bit as well. Um, and there are, dent I don't know if they're dentists or if they're MDs doing injections into the gums. But I have found people who are doing PRP and stem cells. Um, and so I've had patients who've had both and it's not my area of expertise or within my scope of practice to do them. So what I usually tell people is to consult with the person who's doing them and ask questions like, what is, what's the risk benefit? What's the um, cost? What's the procedure like? What's the recovery like? Um, in my experience, what those two procedures have, uh, like my most recent person who had PRP injected was an ankle sprain who had loose ligaments in that ankle and the PRP helped to scar it down. So um, um, I'm just listening to what's going on with the ligaments around the teeth and within the gums. Theoretically, maybe scarring down is something that could be used to improve the robustness of the tissue. However, I'm not an expert on that you would just have to ask the person who's doing those procedures and see what, the, what, what kind of uh, results do they get from their clients is what I would ask. All right, this says, I have limited scleroderma. Tooth number 22 has reabsorbed, discovered at my last checkup. My dentist sent me to an endodontist. I just had the tooth filled and had a root canal. Will reabsorption return in that tooth? What is the chance of this reoccurring in other teeth? Um, I don't know that uh, treating that tooth endodontically is going to um, is going to stop that resorption. The uh, I know why dentists do endodontic treatment on teeth like that, but the issue with the resorption is these cells that are around the outside of the tooth that are eating away at it. And treating the tooth endodontically doesn't remove those. So I've seen cases of, uh, of people who have had endodontic treatment like that. Uh, I'm, by the way, I'm always happy to speak with the, uh, the dentists who are treating patients who have scleroderma to advise them on things like this. 
has to do with teeth, tooth loss as well. It says, I already lost all of my teeth and struggle with an upper denture and lower snap on two implants. Is there any way to prevent and de decrease the continuing bone loss? So this is a common problem that affects everyone with dentures. This isn't only with uh, people who have scleroderma. And um, the, the bone that the teeth sit in, it's called the alveolus. It's on the mandible and the maxilla. And it is only there to support natural teeth. Having the implants may help reduce the loss of some of this bone in the area where the implants are. But eventually, all of the alveolus will go away because there's no teeth there. And you're left with what's called basal bone, which is a very hard type of bone that will not resorb. So um, sadly, with everyone who has dentures, this is a problem. And eventually you end up with, uh, with very small bones and the dentures resting on top of the bones. The implants help keep the bones in place. I mean, help keep the implants in place and also help to keep some of the bone there. Okay. And then um, uh, is, uh, can you talk about the efficacy of hum grafting? Of gum grafting, yeah. Oh, it says hum. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, the grafting is, uh, is is uh, about the same whether you have scleroderma or not. So it does not always work as planned. It almost always improves the condition of the tooth, but um, you know whether it improves it a little or a lot is uh, it, you know is different. And um, another thing that periodontists can do is a procedure called releasing incisions. So if you're someone that it feels like your tongue isn't able to have as full a range of motion, and if doing the exercises that Dr. Vojcik recommended doesn't seem to be working for you, um, then a periodontist can make shallow incisions into the mucosa, the soft tissue under the tongue and in the cheeks and behind the lips to just increase, um, to, to release the tightness and increase uh, motion. And that seems to work for people. Okay, I'm gonna do, okay, small mouth with instruments are very difficult. In fact, they have to kind of go cleaning back through feeling rather than anything else, teeth have overlapped. Um, it, do you have any recommendations about how they can get in better? So a lot of dentists like to use pediatric size instruments and that, that works. Uh, doing the exercises like Dr. Vojcik recommended to improve your opening is a big help. Um, and Patients, patients of the doctor and the hygienist and patients of the patient. Um, I always used to, so I don't see patients in my private practice anymore. Now I only teach full-time at Tufts in the emergency clinic. Um, but in my office, when I was treating patients who had scleroderma, I would always plan on their appointments taking a little extra time. Great, you're such a patient caregiver and not so much caregiving, but helping others learn these things. So thank you very much. I think we're gonna to have to wrap up, wrap up the questions, but really, really appreciate your time. I did have a few people asking about good dentists in various parts of the country. South Florida was one of them. I don't know what their- Dr. South Dr. Florida, Dr. it's very hard to find someone who, uh, who is uh, you know, in the special care dentistry realm. And I don't know why that is. You would think Florida would be crawling with them. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are a couple other questions, but I think we're going to have to have to keep okay. it to that. But thank you so much. Um, on behalf of all of the attendees, we are really grateful for your time. And thank you for joining us today, everybody out there. We were from far places, including Grand Prairie, uh, Canada. My son-in-law grew up there and his family's there. So hello. <laughs> and then... Um, Special thanks to our national sponsors, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, Beringer Ingelheim, and Horizon.
like to connect with you after this virtual conference. We offer multiple support groups options each month, and we can also connect in between meetings via email or phone. Our contact information is also in the chat. If you like this event and want to see more, connect with the Sclerodema Rocky Mountain Foundation chapter. Membership to the foundation is $25 a year, and the donations go towards the Sclerodermis threefold mission of support, education, and research. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our presenters. Uh, we've had two amazing sessions, and I look forward to seeing the third.